You've heard this one before. I've shared it before. Passengers were on an airplane and they were settling in for a comfortable flight when a voice came over the loudspeaker welcoming them and announcing that they had now finally reached the cruising altitude. Passengers could now unfasten their seatbelts. The voice continued by announcing that this was a state-of-the-art, fully automated aircraft. The passengers listened carefully as the voice explained, This aircraft is the pride of our fleet. We no longer require pilots, co-pilots, or navigators. We have eliminated the possibility of human error, and we no longer have them on board. So please, sit back and relax. Everything is under control. The cabin pressure, the altitude, the speed, the direction, everything is now controlled by our onboard computer. We are proud to announce that we are the first to provide you with this upgraded level of service. So just sit back. Remember that nothing, nothing can go wrong. Go wrong. Go wrong. Go wrong. <laughs> can you imagine the anxiety and the level of apprehension that suddenly filled that plane? <laughs> There's a similar kind of anxiety and apprehension that was in our, that was prevalent in our gospel text from Mark this morning. Jesus was with his followers in Jerusalem. The disciples looking at that temple, what an edifice. They, they, they admired it, and it was a sight to behold. It was massive. Larger than any of the sports stadiums that we have in this day and age. It was lavishly adorned with, with gold and with statue, statues and sculptures. So it really was quite impressive. But perhaps more important than what it looked like was what that temple represented. What it represented to the people of Israel. It represented the very presence of God with them. In the midst of that temple, in the middle, there is a place called the Holy of Holies. And that's where it was thought, where God resided. And as long as they had that temple in Jerusalem, they felt that God was with them. As long as they had that temple, they felt secure. Nothing really to worry about, for God was with them. But if something were to happen to that temple, if they no longer had that temple, then all of a sudden they would begin wondering and worrying about their present and future as a people of God. Their present and future as the people of God. So there was great anxiety when Jesus looked around and told his followers that the temple would be so completely demolished that not one stone would rest upon another. To get, the, to get a sense of the, the magnitude of Jesus' statements here and the anxiety and anger, anger, that it caused. We need to remember that according to the Gospel of Mark, this story of Jesus' life that we're reading this year, actually, that we'll finish reading this year because the church new year is December 2nd. We begin the new season. We'll be in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. We'll be in the Gospel of Luke uh, beginning in December. Anyways, we've been in Gospel of Mark this last year. According to the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus was arrested and put on trial... The only charge that stuck had to do with his assertion that the temple would be destroyed. So anxiety and anger. A couple weeks ago, I showed a clip to our Fink students, our junior high uh, confirmation ministry. Showed them a clip of the movie The Titanic. All right, first of all, it's not my favorite film. You know, it's kind of sappy, but um, I showed this clip. And then as I'm reflecting on this clip and reflecting on this text today, it reminded me, both of them reminded me of another scene in that movie. I'm not going to show it to you, but let me just describe it briefly. Um, the lead character, lead female character 
is talking to the designer of that massive ship and the ship's captain. And she says something like, so this is the ship they say is unsinkable? And the answer, it is unsinkable. God himself could not sink this ship. Of course, we know the ending of the movie before we even begin it. That's why it's kind of dumb to watch it. Um, The ship sinks. And the truth of the matter is, eventually, the temple is destroyed. And not very long after Jesus spoke these words. Now, it wasn't during his lifetime. If he died in the year 30 to 33, give or take, the temple was destroyed in the year 70 A.D. So what do we make of this? Here's what I want you to to take from this today. We cannot let the appearances of stability or permanence fool us. Because what we see and what we have can disappear in an instant. Our entire world can be turned upside down in just a moment's time. Ask anyone who's experienced the death of a loved one. Ask anyone who's gotten the bad news of cancer. Ask anyone who's lost a job or who's gone through a divorce or whose parents have gone through a divorce. Ask those people on the east coast of our country whose lives were turned upside down by Hurricane Sandy. And yesterday as I was listening to, what do they call it, Weekend Edition on NPR, there were still people three weeks after the storm who hadn't had power restored to to their homes yet. Our lives can be turned upside down in a moment. Things we assume will be there forever can be ripped away in a second. And while I've been talking about the tragic big things in our lives, our lives can be disrupted in a second, if you will, even the norm, through normal kinds of things. Think about your normal everyday life. Sometimes, at least, our lives are marked by strife and conflict and struggle and exhaustion. A blown test in school. A deadline missed at work. Disagreements with friends. Conflict with the boss. Sometimes it seems as though our lives are simply falling down around us. What then? I see in this Bible reading from Mark a foreshadowing of hope. Jesus said that this, the struggles, is just the beginning of the birth pangs. And as difficult as birth pangs must be, I use the kind of conditional there, I'm a guy, I don't assume I know, but as difficult as birth pangs must be, there is hope for a better day. There's hope for a new birth. As difficult as today is, there is hope for that new life. At one of the ELCA youth gatherings that I've attended, and I can't remember which one it was, it might have been the one we attended together, um, I heard Tony Campolo share his, I call it, his signature sermon. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's a great sermon. But it wasn't until I read his book, and I would commend his book to you, uh, Let Me Tell You a Story, Great Stuff by Campolo, that I understood the context. You see, this wasn't originally his signature sermon. It was someone else's sermon. And as the story goes, Tony Campolo and six other preachers We're each taking one of the last, seven last words of Christ and preaching on them in a Good Friday 
worship service. One of those extended, protracted, long uh, Friday afternoon services are usually about three hours from 12 to 3 traditionally. So seven preachers get up and they each preach in turn on one of the seven last words. Tony was preacher number six. And man, if you know Tony, he did a phenomenal job. I mean, he got done. And he would admit some pride crept in. He was feeling good about his sermon. So good, in fact, that he thought, man, I feel bad for preacher number seven. You know, I said it all. (laughs) And this old pastor got up. And he captivated the congregation with just one phrase, which he kept working over. He started softly. It's Friday. (laughs) But Sunday's coming. And one of the deacons back there someplace yelled, Preach, brother! Preach! (laughs) And that was all the encouragement that he needed. He came on louder and he said, It was Friday. And Mary was crying her eyes out. The disciples were running in every direction like sheep without a shepherd. But that was Friday. But Sunday's coming. (laughs) People in the congregation were beginning to pick up the message. Women, oh, and I've been in preaching classes like this when I took preaching out at a black Baptist school. Women were waving their hands in the air and gently calling, Well, well. And some of the men were yelling, Keep going, yeah. And he kept going. He picked up the volume a little bit more. It was Friday. The cynics were looking at the world and saying, As things have been, so shall they be. You can't change anything in this world. You can't change anything. But those cynics didn't know. It was only Friday. And Sunday's coming. (laughs) You see, he was getting more and more forceful as he went along. It was Friday. (laughs) And on Friday, Pilate thought that he had washed his hands of trouble. The Pharisees were strutting around and laughing and poking each other in the ribs. They thought they were back in charge of things. But they didn't know it was only Friday. And Sunday's coming. And he kept on working that phrase over and over until I don't think the congregation could stand it any longer. At the end of the message, he just yelled, It's Friday! And all 500 members of that congregation yelled with one accord, But Sunday's coming! (laughs) I like that one. (laughs) People, there may be earthquakes and famine and war. There may be cancer and there may be death and there may be the loss of a job and there may be broken relationships. It may be Friday... But Sunday's coming. And Sunday will be experienced by all who trust in Jesus rather than in the magnificent stones of their wealth or their position or their prestige. In the midst of good times, We need to keep our focus on and trust in Jesus. Because nothing else will last forever. In the midst of tough times, we need to keep our focus on and trust in Jesus. Because that's all we really have. And we ought to be living like it. What are you clinging to? What are you trusting in for your security? Keep your focus on and trust in Jesus. In good times and in tough times. In calm times and in anxious times. People of God, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Amen.